That's over. <laughs> I, I usually time things better than that, but you know, we say no perfect people, so I'm going to lead the charge on that one. But uh, so if I haven't met you, my name is Chad. I'm the location pastor here. It's been a fun two plus years, and so we love Scotts Valley and we love this church and this um, and all of our locations. So if you didn't notice, David is uh, leading worship today. He's grown up at the coastlands in Aptos, and that's where he typically serves, but we are one church in multiple locations, and so he stepped in, and, and so it was, a, it was awesome to have him lead us in worship today, and so we get, we get this privilege of being a part of something bigger, and being a part of something that has such a, a reach and such a, a vision for this county and beyond, and it's just, it, I'm, I'm probably going to get distracted if I keep talking about this, because that, that vision really excites me about, like, churches doing church together makes just so much sense to me. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back off that soapbox for a second and get back to our series. Sorry. Uh, I got what I call popcorn brain, and it like, just, like, pop, 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 goes everywhere. So sometimes I need to, like, get the lasso out and reel myself back in. So if, uh, if I seem like I have ADD, I do. And uh, welcome to a church that has a pastor who has ADD. It's fun. It's exciting. It's, it's, in, it's, a, it's a blast. You never know what you're going to get. And coffee doesn't help, right? I mean, that's like my fifth cup today, too, so woo! I do that on Sundays when I need to speak really quickly. I feel like an auctioneer, right? No, but, uh, so we've been going over this series. We're in part seven of Found in the Way, which is looking at Jesus' words, his Sermon on the Mount. It, to me, it's like the how-to Christian. That's what it's like. Jesus is telling us, this is how you follow me. This is how you walk the Christian life. This is the way <clears throat> in which you follow me. See, society wants to tell us that there's one way, two ways, this way, that way. And Jesus says, hold on. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This is the way to follow me. And it started with the Beatitudes, which introduces the kingdom of heaven, but if you read the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, or you were here for those messages, you see that the Beatitudes are kind of this upside-down kingdom con uh, concept, where it doesn't necessarily make sense on a physical level, but once you add in the, that panoramic view of the spiritual level, it makes perfect sense. And then Jesus started to declare the identity of his followers. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light. You are a city on a hill. He's giving us directives of who we are and how we are supposed to interact with humanity, right? So we, we start to learn this upside-down kingdom. We start to learn our role in that. And then last week, he started, or, and then he talks about how he didn't come to remove the law, which was the Old Testament. He, he came to fulfill the prophecies. He came to fulfill the law. He came to be the sacrifice for us to have right relationship with God. And then from there, he starts to talk about this, this larger understanding of sin, and what's really hard is we all can agree as a society that murder is bad, right? Last week we talked about murder. And you go into pretty much any society, any context in the world over any, like you just pick a place on the map and a time in existence, and you're probably going to find out that they too agree that murder is bad. I don't, I, I, I'm unaware, I'm not going to say they don't, but I'm unaware of a, of a community that says, yeah, we are like striving to be the best murderers. I haven't found that yet, and I'm, I'm glad I haven't, because I'm still living. I would probably fail at that, at that game. But, so Jesus starts it there, and he says, like, murder's bad, but even the desire to kill, even anger is, is missing the mark. And then he's, this week, we're coming into the next passage of that, and he starts with a wide net that most people, if not all people, are going to say murder's bad, and then takes it in a context. And this one is going to be a little bit more uncomfortable, and next week it's going to get even more uncomfortable. So I wanted to give you a heads up, because what makes it uncomfortable for me is, have you ever, like I have, have you ever looked for loopholes? Anyone ever looked for a loophole? Like, I mean, you're playing a board game, and you're like, man, how can I like take this? And my wife just told me the other day, she's like, all right, don't wordsmith it in order to get the response you want. And I was like, wait, what are you saying? Are you saying I look for loopholes? You say, and I try to like strategize things. She's like, yep. I was like, oh, you're onto that. Okay. But so I'm constantly, it's like a game to me. I love like looking for loopholes. I want to figure out a way to beat the system. I don't like the system. I want to beat it. 
And so when I was in college, I'm gonna, it, it was Bible college. I'm going to Bible college online. We had just had Noah, and so my time is thin. I'm working full time, going to school, and have a newborn. I don't have much capacity. And so I decide to look for a loophole. I had a paper due, and it had, I forget how many words it was, we'll just say it was a 500 word paper. And I was like, man, I do not have the capacity or time to sit down and write a 500, pa uh, 500 word paper on slavery in the context of the book of Philemon. Which if you're, if you're familiar with the Bible, Philemon is only one chapter, so it's not a long book. But I was like, man, I gotta read that, and then I gotta figure out this huge topic and like narrow it down and do this, and I just, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, so I found a loophole. You know what I did? I copied and pasted the entire book of Philemon and cited it in my paper, and then wrote a paragraph about it. And it met the word, it met the word count. And I was like, sweet. I just did very little work, and I just, I'm gonna cite the entire book of the Bible. Just copy, paste, write a paragraph. There you go. There you go. I'm done. My, uh, my professor emailed me back with not such nice words to say because I got caught looking for a loophole. And that was just, that was a heart matter. Now, I could justify it in my time. I could justify it in my, in my experience. I could justify it in, in so many different ways. Like, I mean, I, I withdrew from going to college because I said, why am I going to school to get a degree to do what I'm doing? I justified it. I was looking for a loophole, right? And so, yes, you heard that right. Your pastor cheated in Bible college and then dropped out. <laughs> but I'd say, I'd, I mean, you guys are the ones here. Like, who's... Uh, no, so, we, we like to look for loopholes. At least we, me, I like to look for loopholes. I like to figure out if I can get that free sandwich before I get that 11th stamp, right? I want to see if I can get that, like, fold it over and just double the stamp when it's still wet. You know, I'm looking for a loophole. That, someone's going to try that next time, I know. Someone's going to go to Pizza My Heart and be like, it worked. But uh, as, as we dive into this, like, Jesus is addressing the heart issue of, of the culture that he's in. He's got, he's got disciples with him. He's got uh, Pharisees with him. He's got unbelievers with him. And he's just laying it all out there. And he's calling us up, not calling us out, but it starts at the heart. And that's what we learned last week, is that sin starts in the heart. And so we're, we're learning more about how much Jesus cares about the inside who you are than the outside what you do, right? So I want to give you a disclaimer. The next uh, couple of verses that we're going to be looking at today, I think, I think it's referred to now as a, a disclaimer or a trigger warning. Um, I think that's what I've, I've seen, like, this could be a little, a little hard for some people, but I, I want you to know that it always ends in hope. It always ends positively, because Jesus conquered everything. So when you put your hope in Jesus, you've already won. But I just want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer that this could be a toe stepper. You might get your, your toe stepped on in, as I read this, okay? You have heard it, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her a victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It's the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, verses 27 through 32. So in our culture, in our context, that's a lot different than then, back then. Unfortunately, the divorce rate in America is roughly 50%. And that's a big unfortunately. I think there's a lot of stats, there's a lot of, a lot of information out there, and, and I'm, everyone that I've talked to, there's, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
trauma that's not just the, the, the two people that are in the marriage, but the, the family around them, the friends around them. There's a lot of pain and a lot of trauma that re- revolve around this topic. There's a lot, of, a lot of heartache that revolves around adultery or stepping outside of your commitment, your relationship. There's a lot of, of heart issue in this. And so I wanted, I wanted to look at this, and I, and I believe that moving forward, we are going to talk about lust, adultery, and divorce, but I also want you to know I believe that Jesus was using this as the vessel to carry relationships. That, that these topics were the vessel that Jesus wanted to say, I want to talk about your heart in relationships. Because that's what Jesus came to do, is make us in right relationship with God. And, the, and marriage is the most important, chosen, earthly relationship. And so that, that's the weight. That's the gra- Like Jesus, last week, we talked about anger equals murder. That's a big stretch, but it's a heart issue. So if we're talking about relationships, we've got to go to the most important relationship. And that's your chosen relationship. So our big idea, what we're going to be looking to get from this today, is that the way of Jesus reclaims our value and redeems his design. We as people like to use our words or our actions to devalue others. Because somewhere along the lines, we thought, we got it wrong, that if I can put you down, it raises me up. When really it doesn't. But we we operate that way. We live under that lie. That if I can put you down, then I get raised up. And so we're going to look at how the way Jesus reclaims our value. And his design, if you go to the garden, his design is not the world that we live in. His design was not to have sin in our, in our existence, in our world. That was our choice. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus wants to bring us back to the design of God. He wants to pull us back out of the darkness, out of sin. He wants to bend down and pick us up and restore us. He wants to redeem his design. So our first point is reclaims value. Reclaims value. The way, of God, uh, the way of Jesus reclaims value. And when we look to lust, it devalues, commodifies, objectifies, and creates injustice. Lust is a silent, silent, painful struggle for so many people. Now, what's, what's breaking my heart is years ago, the, the con- I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and even just a decade ago, the conversation about adult content, about pornography, was towards teenage boys. Unfortunately, our society now, that conversation has broken into every aspect. No age, no gender, no job context, nothing. It's, it, it, it's, it's something that has permeated our society. And it's chasing after lust. That's, Jesus is saying that that's never going to fulfill you. That's never going to satisfy you. It is not a real relationship. It is pretend. It is fake. It is make-believe. It's only going to hurt you and rob you of the true joy that a right relationship can really bring you. And it, it creates this injustice where we, we, we trick ourselves into saying that, well, they decided to put that image on the internet. They chose, they made this contract, they made this, this, uh, this self-made decision but it still creates injustice for them because it, creates, it, it makes that man or woman an object. It makes that man or woman something to just be used, which that is not God's heart for you. You are not disposable. You're not disposable. You have value. And when you understand your value... You don't tolerate it. And when you see the value in others, 
You don't put up with it. And that's why Jesus loves us. It's because he sees the value in you. And he wants us to see the value of others as well. Back in the 1400s, when, when um, uh, explorers were going off and finding new lands, they, they started to bring back goods and, and stuff from these foreign uh, lands that they were discovering, and they started to bring back pineapples to, like, England and, and Spain. And these pineapples were, like, the coolest thing ever because they look weird and they taste delicious. And so pineapples became a huge, huge cultural icon, right? Just pineapples. I'm talking pineapples. I mean, if you, uh, I, I've never been to Europe, but I've seen pictures and structures where they started to incorporate pineapples into their architecture. Like there's, there's pineapples. You could rent, rent a pineapple and have it on display at your party, not even eat it because you had to return it just to show people how well off you were. Because it was a, it was a symbol of, of wealth and, and a, a ability to, to get what you want. Like you, it was just the status of pineapples. It was of such value. Pineapples were so expensive. So if you got to eat a pineapple, wow. You were like balling. You had a yacht. You were like Jeff Bezos. Like you didn't, it didn't matter. Money was, n- money was not a problem. I'm just about to start going into some old hip-hop, but um, <laughs> more money, more problems. That's what they say. Uh, no, but pineapples were of such value because they were rare. And so the value of the pineapple was here. But now in our culture, you can go to Walmart or Target, and you can get a can of pineapples for 98 cents. What changed? Cultural's view of the pineapple because it became accessible. It became out there. So the, the supply and demand actually diminished the value of the pineapple. Now, you're not a pineapple. Thank God. Because I would be, feel really weird if I was just talking to a room of pineapples. I'd be like, man, check me in. But... Uh, but, like, the, 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 the thought still, still tracks, right? The thought still tracks that if, if you don't view yourself as unique, individual, perfectly, fearfully, wonderfully made, and you start to give that out to anyone and everyone, the value of that is going to be perceived as none. And our culture has devalued people via the internet. Just because it's free doesn't mean it doesn't cost you something. It is costing us so much in our relationships, in our hearts, in our worldview, in our understanding of God. God wants to reclaim your value because of this, Genesis 1, 26, 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blesses them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You are made in the image of God. Let that sit for a second because I think we blow over that too much in our in modern churches. We just know these things and it's we've heard these things, but we don't sit to hear these things. You're made in the image of God. You want to talk about value? The living God who conquered sin, who conquered death, who created the heavens, who breathes the stars, took the time to create you. Design you. And then it restores dignity. Jesus wants to restore your dignity. See, only a valued person can show value. 
I grew up hearing that hurting people hurt people. That was a, a, a page of grace. Like my parents would say, you know, that person made fun of you. They, they, they name called you. Hey, maybe they're hurting. Hurting people hurt people. Healthy people help people. Valued people value people. Valued people value people. Don't be around people users. Because it's not going to end well for you. Give value to people. Show, acknowledge value in others. It costs nothing to give a compliment. It costs nothing to encourage someone. Be a part of God's plan to restore dignity and to reclaim value. It's an invitation. You get to do this. There's, a, there's a, a parable or a story um, in the Gospels where Jesus is coming into a town, a village, like he, like he did. He was on, I call it the Jesus tour, you know? He's on, he's on tour, and he's going from town to town, village to village, and he's, he's healing people. He's sharing the gospel. He's entering the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching people. He's restoring people. He's casting out demons. You name it, he's just doing all the stuff. He's Jesus being Jesus. And then there was this tax collector named Zacchaeus who heard he was coming into town. Now, I love it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he. So apparently he was short. And so Zacchaeus was like, man, I want to see this Jesus guy. I've heard so much about this guy. I want to see it with my own eyes. And so he ran out ahead, and he climbed up a tree so he could get a better view, so he could see over the crowds. I've never had that problem. Like, when I go to a concert, I'm usually the one blocking people. But I, I've, heard, I've heard that if you can't see over someone, you can get above them, you can see them. You can see. So that's what Zacchaeus did. He was smart. He got into a tree. I'm not a tree climber. He was, right? So I don't have a lot to do with Zacchaeus, but there's something that me and Zacchaeus do have in common. Is that we need Jesus to restore our dignity. You see, he had money. He was a tax collector. So what he was, he didn't have friends, but he had money. But he had no dignity. He was a social outcast. He was, he was not invited to the party. So he ran a, ahead and he climbed a tree to see Jesus. And this man with no dignity and no friends, but a lot of influence, a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of nothingness, really. Jesus stops and he looks up into that tree and he says to Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I want to eat lunch with you at your house today. Not even just, I love that Jesus didn't just invite him to what he was doing. Jesus didn't say, hey, you can tag along, sure, no worries. I got a slew of people behind me anyways, what's one more? He said, no, I'm going to go to you. I'm going to meet you where you are. And I'm going to show all these people who are watching me that you're restored. That your dignity is back. Because I've given you my approval and my value. That's the Jesus we're talking about. That's the relationships we're seeking, is one that gives value and dignity. The I see you moment. I'm sure as a young person, or even as a person now, you've had that, that mentor, that person that has said the I see in you conversation. It might sound a little different, but really it's the you're made for more. I see in you more than you see for yourself. And if no one's had that conversation, I pray someone walks into your world that will honestly be able to tell you what you need to hear because you're made for more. And Jesus invites us into that life. Jesus invites us into that more. He gives you purpose. And then the way of Jesus redeems his design. So our value has been reclaimed, our dignity has been restored, and now our design is going to be redeemed. When they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery.
Where is your heart hard? Where have you put a callus or a, or a covering or a built a wall in your life that is blocking the design of God? Is it in your worldview? Is it in your relationships? It is, it, is it in your heart? Is it towards your, your parents, your sister, your brother, your kid? Where? I got them. God lets me know sometimes that he's chipping away at the walls that I've built up. And it hurts. I'm going to be honest, it hurts. But when those walls come down and those relationships are restored and that value is reclaimed and that dignity's back, his design for relationships, his design for the way forward, his design for the Jesus life, nothing better. There's nothing better than living in, the, in what God has called you to, how he called you to. Nothing better than it. I'm going to pause for a second. And please don't say it out loud. Just say it to yourself. There's one person in your head right now that you need to restore the relationship with. And I want you to sit for a second. And when I say blink, just say it to yourself. And I want you to act on that. Blink. You want to act on that. You want to restore that relationship. There is someone in your heart that you have become hard towards. And you, you're calloused. And that's not what God wants for you. That's not what God has for you. Restore that relationship. Now, it doesn't mean you have to like buddy, buddy, trust, go hang out, be BFFs. That's not what I'm saying. But you can forgive, release, and move forward in a healthy way. Trust and forgiveness are not codependent. But forgiveness is necessary for health. See, when Jesus is Lord, not just Savior, when Jesus is Lord, when Jesus is King, when Jesus is ruler of your life, man, that's a tough one for me because that means I have to submit. That means I have to lay down. That means I have to release. It's a tough one for me. But when Jesus is Lord, it reveals our part in this injustice. I have an older brother, and we used to fight all the time. My mom would always say it takes two to tango. You have a part in this injustice. It might be small. Sure, they might have done more. Absolutely, I'm not going to say you did it all. It's not 50-50, but it takes two to tango. And when Jesus is Lord, it reveals, it reveals your part of the injustice. And when you follow the way of Jesus, it brings honor and respect, and that's the kingdom way. That's the kingdom way. See, God respects and honors us so much that he gave us free will. And it's wild to me because I look at a lot of the stuff that humanity does and go, why would you allow that? Because God respects your free will. And when we do things the kingdom way, when we follow the way of Jesus, we restore honor and respect to our relationships. And there's not a relationship on this earth that can't use a little bit more honor and respect and dignity and value. And that's his design, not ours. You see, fantasies, lust, are based on our design. The fantasies are based on my design. And they're always me-centered. I'm always winning the game. I'm always the hero. I'm always the best. I'm always the center of my own fantasies because they're based on my design. But God wants for you is his design. God's design is the healthy way. It's the Jesus way. It's the one who will who will sacrifice themselves for another. Who will love, even on the cross, being crucified out of murder for no reason. He will say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They know not what they do. Man, what a powerful, powerful moment that Jesus 
in his final breaths was thinking about you. As much as you've hurt him, he's forgiving you in that moment. He's, he's going to bat for you. He's pleading to the Father on your behalf. When if I'm, if I'm honest, I put him on that cross every day through my actions, through my choices, through my disobedience. See, the kingdom mindset brings value to you and to others. It dignifies you to bring honor to others. It in institutes the original design of God so that we can value others. And so our road, our path to redemption is from Romans 12 to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change your thinking. Think differently. Adjust your worldview. And for that, I think a lot of us need to hear for a second that we need to change what we're listening to. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Are you being discipled more by Fox News or CNN or the gospel? Are you being discipled more by Facebook and, and TikTok and Instagram or by Peter, James, John, Jesus, Peter, Paul, Silas, Thomas? Who, who's got the voice in your head? Is it Jesus or is it humanity? Change the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You want to know what the will of God is for you? Ask him. And then listen to it. So here's our takeaway. See people through God's eyes, including yourself. Start to see yourself as valued. See yourself through God's eyes, and you see others through that too. Find someone to pray with you about it. If you're not in one of our groups, jump in one. We'll have other, other group sessions launching soon. But there's people in this, in this church at any of our locations, or even online, that will pray with you. We have a prayer team in the back during worship. Go get prayer. You don't have to do this alone because you're valued, and you add value to us. And then take steps towards accountability and freedom. Give someone permission in your life to hold you accountable. There are people in my life that I have said awkwardly, I'll say awkwardly, I've had those, those dinner conversations where I say, hey, I wanted to have dinner with you because I want to give you permission to call me out. If you hear something, see something, do something in, in me that's not healthy, that's not good, that's not going towards Jesus, you have the permission to say it. I encourage you to do the same. It's so freeing. It's liberating to have that. That's our road for, forward to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We bow your heads. Jesus, thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, Lord, that you have, you have re, you've reclaimed us, you've restored our value, Lord, that we are dignified because of you. You cover us, Jesus. And I pray right now for the, the, the way forward that you would give us courage. You would give us boldness to stand against these lies, to stand in opposition of the enemy, Lord, that we would see the value of others. Lord, that we would, we would feel the value that you have for us and that our relationships would grow and flourish as you've designed so at this moment, if you, if you haven't said yes to Jesus and you want to follow the way of Jesus, this, this kingdom mindset that we learned about today, if you want to get in right relationship with God, I want to give you an opportunity right now to lift your hand or, or make eye contact with me. Yes. Or if you feel like you've drifted and you've and you've, you, you want to re-engage. You've been complacent, and you want to re-engage with a relationship with God. If that's you, raise your hand, look up. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. God's waiting there to give you dignity and restoration. Back to his design, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.